One of the reasons why I started the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast is because I believe our kids, the new generation, have a bit of a problem. We don't really know what the future is going to look like. There's so much change happening right now that even what I do for a living, it wasn't an option and it didn't even exist 10 to 15 years ago. So today I brought on a guest, Rachel Duffy, who's a conscious parenting coach to talk about parenting, how do we parent better, how do we prepare our kids for the future, and how do we become more conscious when it comes to parenting. So if you're interested in that, keep on listening. Hi, I'm Brandon Lucero, and you are about to experience the new way to thrive in business, entrepreneurship, and life by leaning into who you are, what you love, and standing up for what you want to create. Get ready because this is where we go against the grain, say no to outdated society norms, and we say yes to change in order to create a happier, more fulfilled world. Welcome to the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast. Uh, this is gonna be a unique episode for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, one of the reasons why I started the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast was to talk about uh, how to bring up the new generation. And although not every episode is about that, because I love talking about a lot of different things, I, talk, I love talking about kids, parenting, but mostly messaging, business, mindset. Today is gonna be mostly focused on uh, the parenting side, it'll be focused on the newer generation and how we can bring kids up to follow their passion, to be happier. And uh, we have a very special guest to come on to the podcast today, who is uh, not only a, a coach for us, but an amazing friend, someone that um, has helped me look at parenting in a completely different light. And that is uh, Rachel Duffy. So Rachel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor and hashtag goals to be on your podcast. <laughs> well, I love that. Um, it's always great to have people that you know believe in what we do on the podcast. And you have a company called Sagacity Labs and you are a conscious parenting, would you say coach? Is that is that the right term, label? Yeah, we could say coach, coach, mentor, um, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, what I do is I help parents um, find a, a different way to look at parenting because I think the way we've been raised, all of us, we're so deeply conditioned to look at parenting in certain ways that we have never questioned. And I think that in and of itself is what causes so much of our pain as parents and it causes so much frustration and like you, Brandon, mm -hmm. I would say I'm in the business of shifting beliefs. Yeah, I'm in the business of changing perspective, of applying critical thinking, of questioning everything we thought we knew about parenting and about children. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that we stand for. That's one of the reasons why I love what we do is because we have to help people like you and other people who have you know changes that they want to make uh, have the tools to be able to do that. But it's really interesting because you take those very similar concepts. And I think this is why you and I get along so well is because we kind of think uh, the same way and we have goals or uh, methods of how we approach change and it's very similar. And you approach parenting almost the same way that I approach messaging in business, which is unbelievable. Um, for the listeners who don't really know what conscious parenting is, can you just kind of give a definition of what that is and, and why it's so important um, not only for raising kids, but like just for the new generation of, of, I guess, the world. Yeah. So, you know, to be honest with you, I don't get hung up so much on what I call it, if it's conscious parenting or you call it whatever you want. The point is to, to become conscious means to become more aware. Mm -hmm. And as we, I know you talk a lot about developing our awareness in business and in messaging, the same applies in our personal lives and in parenting. And the truth is we are in a slumber most of the time because we just go on some kind of autopilot regurgitating patterns and conditionings and beliefs that we've inherited one generation after another. And we're really not aware of what we do with our kids. We're not aware of how we lead our lives and we're not aware of how we set ourselves and them up for a lifetime of uh, discontentment, really. Mm. 
And I was going to ask you what some of those problems were. And you said a lifetime of discontentment, but what else, like, what are the problems that can arise um, if we're not careful or aware of what's going on? So what I see time and time again, and, you know, I started um, my career as a divorce attorney and I shifted into entrepreneurship and into parent coaching because I'm super passionate about helping families. And originally I thought I was going to help them from a place of where the family unit breaks apart. Mm -hmm. But ultimately I felt this was way more empowering to be able to help parents at an earlier stage in the family life. Because what I see time and time again is people who are extremely devoted, loving, caring parents who really want to do their best in parenting. People who believe parenting is the most important job or role of their lives. And I certainly belong in that group as well. Yeah. And yet we find ourselves in these situations where the kids are not listening, they're disrespectful, they're um, shutting us out, or, um, you know, we, we're having, we, we come up with challenges and we don't know what to do with it. We right. don't know how to handle it. So we try, um, e either we try looking up solutions in a book or we try getting advice from family or friends, or we, we even take our children to professionals so that they can help us fix them as if it were a problem to be fixed, as if there is a solution that if I could only find that solution somewhere out there, then the whole family will live happily ever after. That's kind of the linear thinking that we get trapped into. Right. So, you know, we, we are conditioned to think in that way, in that linear fashion, but relationships, parenting and life are really anything but linear. Right. So these solutions end up maybe working in the short term, but they don't work in the long term. And actually, they cause us more problems that we're completely unaware of. Can so again, back to your question on consciousness, it is becoming aware of what it is exactly that we're communicating to our children. It is becoming um, aware of the fact that we've forgotten who we really are. Yep. And if we don't remember who we are, how are we supposed to help our children develop who they are? Yeah. Can you give me an example um, of like what you're talking about? Because you said something like the ways in which we've been parenting just never get questioned. And a lot of times we don't even think we should question it. Can you give me an example of what that may be that most parents could relate to? Yeah. So I think one thing that we think is a mandatory part of our job as parents is to uh, discipline or um, give consequences to our children when they cross boundaries. Mm. Punishment, discipline, consequences are taken for granted as a mandatory part of your job as a parent. If you don't have those, you have failed your job. You are raising children who will end up in prison or... Uh, you know, who will be somehow dysfunctional in society. Mm -hmm. And we never question that. We never ask ourselves, what are we really saying to our children? What is this really doing to them? What is this doing to our relationship as a family? And more importantly, is there another way or could there be another way? Right. Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense um, because I, I was reading the book, uh, shoot, what was it called? Um, Dale Carnegie, Win Friends and Influence People, something like that, Influence People. And in the first chapter that he, what he talks about is uh, in the business forum, working with employees and stuff, is that they found that when you, and this is just human behavior in general, that when you uh, punish people or discipline them, the react, they studied their reactions from that and how effective they became as an employer or someone in society versus if you just reinforce the good behavior, uh, how much more effective they, they they became. And he gave this example of people wearing their hard hats on the job site. And he said that they were enforcing a punishment discipline when you didn't wear the hard hat. And then what he's, and people would resent them. They would only wear it when the boss was around. But then they started saying, hey, I really appreciate you wearing the hard hat. I love that you value safety. 
Well, all of a sudden people willingly and happily started wearing the hard hats. And so if I understand you correctly, are you, are you, do you take a very similar approach when it comes to parenting or is that a, a method that you teach instead of the punishment route? So I think, first of all, when we talk about um, punishment and correction, and, I, and to your point, we even call our prisons correction facilities, right? Mm, yeah. And yet, how many of our prisoners have been repeat prisoners? Right. Because so if punishment worked, wouldn't they stop doing what got them into prison in the first place? But instead, what we see is time and time again, prisoners entering the system, the correctional system, but they're not getting corrected. Why is that? Because right. we are only addressing their behavior. We're trying to fix their behavior instead of understanding why they have this behavior in the first place. Mm. And it always comes back to unmet emotional needs. But as parents, when we look at our children, we just want those fires put out because it grates on our nerves. It pushes our buttons. Mm. So we look at them as, OK, they are behaving in a rude way or they are not listening, hitting or exhibiting some kind of unwanted behavior. Right. Now, I'm not saying that that doesn't need to be changed. Right. I don't want to raise children who think it's OK to harm another person. Right. At the same time, when that happens. I ask myself, okay, why is my child doing this? If they're not two years old and maybe two year, two year olds don't really have another way to communicate their feelings. But if I have a, I have a nine year old, if my nine year old is hitting, I have to really ask myself, what is going on here with this child? Yeah. What are they trying to tell me? What need have I not met that I can look into now? Yeah. And, uh, I think my biggest complaint about the medical system is that they they do like a Band-Aid instead of getting to the core. And it sounds like that's what punishment and sometimes parenting can do is we, we're really just the short term Band-Aid fix over something in the moment versus getting to the core issue of what's really going on. Is, is Am I understanding that correctly? A hundred percent. And even worse is these Band-Aid solutions that we apply with our kids not only do they not fix the problem we're trying to fix, they create different problems that are mm. way more difficult to fix. What do you, what do you mean? Uh, give me an example. So if we're back on this um, example that we've been using about punishment, we punish our children because every parent will find the leverage they need to use in order to get their child to comply. Every parent. Yeah. We all know what those things are that our children value so highly that they'll do anything for. Right. So if you want to get your child to obey, I'm confident you can find the leverage, whether it's taking away screen time or sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes it's a reward, you know, promising a coveted toy or a family right. vacation, whatever it is. You find that leverage. Yep. So you fix the problem in the moment, they will obey you. You can get a child to obey. But what does that cost you? Mm -hmm. What does that cost you, A, in the quality of your relationship with your child, which is now based on obedience and fear? What does it cost your child in the blueprint that they're going to use one day when they pick their own adult relationships? Mm -hmm. Because to them, an intimate relationship, this is what it's based in. Bribery, fear, manipulation, obedience. And what does it cost them in their own self-esteem? What do they think about themselves when they get punished? And, you know, we try, a lot of parents try to kind of use nicer words than punishment. We say, oh, let's, you know, go away, take a time out, calm down, and come back when you're more civilized and we can talk. But during that time out, what is that child feeling about themselves? And right. how does this affect their long-term self-esteem, which impacts their whole life? Well, and yeah, it impacts their whole life, but also how they're going to parent as well. It's a generational type of thing. And at some point, the whole generational, um, I guess, structure of parenting needs to change. Otherwise, it's just a, a whole repetition. 
And I, you said something that's really interesting I never thought about before is that when you are punishing them, um, you're, you, what kids basically from zero to seven years old is when they form, and correct me if I'm wrong, but from my understanding of it is from zero to seven is when they basically form a lot of their structures, their perceptions of the world, their belief systems, um, the, the, the way in, w- in which the world operates. And if you're teaching them that at this young of the age, I never realized that they would be looking for that inside of a relationship in the future. I mean, when it almost makes me think like <laughs> now when people, I hear parents say like, oh, I don't like the person that my my son or, or or daughter is dating. It's like, well, now I'm wondering, well, what did you do as a parent that taught them this is what I what I want, you know? It's a little, it's a little scary. So it is because so, you you know that uh, this is something that you see a lot in uh, households where there was a lot of control, discipline, a lot of rigid rules. Mm-hmm. Those children who were so highly controlled grow up to be adults who look to either control others or be controlled by others. Interesting. It makes a lot of sense. As soon as you're talking, I'm sure the audience is doing this too. You're like, okay, that explains this person. And they're like, <laughs> like okay, this, things are making a lot of sense now. And what's really interesting is we kind of went down this whole path of punishment, but punishment was only one example. Cause I had asked you, what's an example of, of things that have never been questioned? I mean, how deep does this really go? Like, is it just punishment, the big one, or is there other ways in which uh, parenting should be questioned? Well, if you ask me, I think everything should be questioned. Yeah. I think if you, to me, critical thinking is a core value of my life. Yeah. And I accept that my parents, like most parents, my parents are loving, devoted, sweet, wonderful people who had the absolute best intentions. And yet, I am, now that I'm a parent, I question everything they taught me. Yeah. And I, encourage my children to do that too. Even in real time, as I'm parenting them, I encourage them to question me, to question everything, to apply critical thinking to everything, not only including me, maybe I should say, especially me, because I'm biased and I have an agenda. As conscious as I am, I know that I cannot escape that. So when we look at what our parents taught us and how deeply conditioned we are in our families, in our environments, in our cultures, you can start questioning everything. And once you do your own work to remember who you are, Mm -hmm. then you can ask yourself, okay, does this resonate with me or not? And if it doesn't, what does? When you say remember who you are, what is that? How do you mean that specifically as a parent? Yeah, I think we come into this world with um, a fingerprint and we have authenticity to us. If you look at very young children, they're extremely authentic. They speak with no filter. Mm -hmm. They act the way they act. They don't care what they look like. They don't care if they seem silly. Over time, they become conditioned. Yeah. Yeah. They, they learn that they're expected to behave in certain ways. And they learn that when they behave in certain ways, they get more love from their parents. Mm. Now, we are hardwired to need love from our parents because we're acutely aware, even as infants, we're acutely aware of how dependent we are. If our parents don't love us, where does that leave us? We can't fend for ourselves, not Mm. as infants, not as toddlers, and not as children either. So a child that is faced with the choice between being authentic and doing what they need to do so their parents love them, guess what they're going to choose? Yeah, I mean. Repeat that a million times over for 18, 20, 30 years and you've buried deep inside you, you've buried who you really were. Right. So then you have to go back and do your work to remember who is that person? What does that person want? What kind of expectations was I trying to meet? Expectations that belong to somebody else, they don't even belong to me. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I know you and I had a conversation recently and I was telling you like, I, I think 
children are the most beautiful form of human beings on this planet because it's just all possibility, generally always happy, um, can make a, anything be fun. Like I just watch my kids and there's like playing with a stick in the dirt and they like are the most happiest people in the, in the world, you know? And then you see them get conditioned over time. And it's like, as a parent, I almost just want to stop the conditioning. I know it's not, it's impossible. Like it's going to happen. Um, but if I hear, if I am hearing you correctly, what you're saying is as the parent, we have to look back to when we were kids and look at how, what kind of conditioning did we take on that got us to who we are today. And remember that isn't really who we are. It's what the world told us to be. And the first step would be just kind of unwinding that. Is that correct? A hundred percent. And I can, I can share from my own personal experience of going through this. I was meeting all the expectations. I was the good girl. I was the best student. I was the first person to raise my hand for anything. I jumped into any leadership responsibility, you name it, I did it. And I'm extremely accomplished and well-educated. And I, you know, that's all great. But ultimately I followed a path that somebody else laid out for me. Yeah. I followed a blueprint that didn't belong to me. And even though I excelled following that path, I was miserable. Right. I wasn't happy. It wasn't my blueprint. It wasn't what I wanted to do. If I, if you asked me when I was a kid what I wanted to do, I would have said, I want to be a teacher and I want to be on stage. Right. But I was conditioned to be financially independent. I was conditioned to choose from a very specific menu of um, jobs yep. that my parents thought were, this is what you do if you want to be, you know, if you want to grow up to be able to take care of yourself and be independent. And like, it was very clear, doctor, accountant, lawyer, there was a very clear list. And I picked one right. and I did great, but I was miserable yeah. because in my mind, a teacher or uh, being on stage, I, I was only seeing it as, uh, you know, an actress. I mean, those were, those weren't real jobs. Right. And as a parent, why, why is that so important? Like I get, I understand why remembering who we are and, and breaking the conditioning down, um, as just a level of like, just being a human who's happy. Like that to me, that's, that's the beginning stages of really truly following your passion is to get rid of the conditioning. But as a parent, why is that so important to get to that place? Because you can't show your children how to do something that you haven't done for yourself. Mm. Children can smell inauthenticity a mile away. Anyone can but, really. That is true. That is true. But, but children can too. Sometimes yeah. we think they're too young or they don't understand. But I think energetically, they feel what's real and what's not real. And they actually learn from us in nonverbal ways, way more than whatever we think we're teaching them. Right. So if you haven't done that for yourself, how are you ever going to model that for your child? They're going to learn from the way you are being in this world. And if you're being inauthentic, if you're being conditioned, if you are really miserable inside, that is the blueprint they're going to follow no matter what you tell them. Okay. So I'm trying to put all the pieces together because um, I a hundred percent believe what you're saying, but let's just go back to the, the punishment for example. Um, you're saying that we don't really want a punishment because punish them or discipline them because it, te it teaches these underlying, well, it could create underlying issues. It's not getting to the core of it. So when I, we as a parent get to the core of who we are, the essence of who we are, how do we get our kids or to to stop doing things that would need a punishment? Does that make sense? Like, like I'll just give you an example. Um, if my son doesn't want to like clean his room or something like that, and then me finally undoing a lot of mind conditioning, how does that undoing the conditioning help me get my son to clean his room? his room. Does that question make sense? Totally. Okay. So first of all, 
when we say or when I say that I don't punish my children, it does not mean that I don't have boundaries. Okay. So if my child got in the car and said, I'm not putting on my car, my seatbelt, be, just because I don't punish doesn't mean that that is an acceptable behavior. Right. So we have to, you know, I have to, I feel like I have to say that first because a lot of times people, um, people think what I'm talking about is really very permissive, lax parenting. Right. And it is not at all that. On the contrary, when you are more conscious and more present in the moment, I feel like that is acute focus and attunement to what is happening with your child and you respond to that. But when you've done, to your question, when you've done your work of remembering who you are, peeling back the conditionings, now you can view your child through a clear lens as opposed to a lens of projecting onto them all this garbage that you had been accumulating. Right. You see, when we're so conditioned to think in certain ways and certain patterns, we project that onto our children. And then instead of seeing who they really are and what they really need, we're only responding to our own needs okay. instead of theirs. Does so that make sense? I think so. Let me let me recap it and you let me know if I understand. So let's use that seatbelt example. Um, you get in the car. I'm just imagine my son doesn't want to put on a seatbelt. What will happen in most cases is a conditioned response will take place with parents, which is usually an emotional response of like, you do this and you do it because I told you to do it and blah, 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 right? Whatever. It's just like this shouting, screaming, you're going to be in trouble. I'm going to do this if you don't do that. So you're basically forcing them to go do it. Whereas if we are uh, able to remember who we are, we kind of unwind that emotional um, automated response that we've been conditioned to, we can analyze the situation a little bit better. We can go, okay, well, like for me, William is an emotional uh, little boy. He needs to understand why he's doing something before doing it. My response to him is like maybe something like, well, why aren't you putting it on? Like I'm getting to the core of the issue. Like, why don't you want to put it on? What's really going through your head? Okay. Is, and then we can maybe come to a better solution of like, okay, well, maybe you didn't realize this. Well, I mean, you're having an actual conversation with them at that point is in my understanding, everything correctly. Is that make, making sense? Yes. And, and I think the important piece of, you know, when you, when you say to your kid, put your seatbelt on and they say no, and our knee jerk reaction is to get into some kind of conflict. The reason for that is because they pushed our button in that moment. Right. When they said no, we are now replaying some kind of, you know, it's, it's really some kind of trauma response that we've been carrying from our own childhood and we're projecting it onto this interaction with our child. Right. And it's preventing us from getting to the bottom of what is actually happening. Why is your child not putting their seatbelt on? Is it because something's uncomfortable for them? Is yeah. it because there's a deeper thing going on? Is it because they need to be, they, they need to feel more connected with you to, in order to pay attention to you? There, there could be a million things but we can't even get to those things if we're in this loop, you know, if we can't even get out the gate and we're stuck in this loop of being so reactive to what they said to us. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. So it almost takes out, it seems like it, it starts limiting the reactiveness. It starts limiting the condition conditioned emotional response to allow us to finally get to those lower or not lower, but deeper levels of, where the problem's actually coming up from. Right, and, and ultimately, I mean, what do we all want as parents? We wanna know we did a good job. We want to set them up to be successful and happy, whatever that means to them. We want We wanna feel good about the day, right? We don't wanna go to bed feeling like, ugh, I messed it up today. Yeah. And waking up the next morning with a, a promise, OK, today I'm going to stay calm. And five minutes later, you're already yelling and screaming and feeling like a failure. It's this vicious cycle we get ourselves into. It's like a roller coaster. Yeah. It's an emotional roller coaster because it's 
unpredictable. It's chaotic. It goes from high to low in, in the blink of an eye. And it's extremely uncomfortable and bumpy. Right. So I have a couple of questions. Um, I want to start moving into the direction of like, well, how as parents, how do we, how do we incorporate some of this to raise kids that go follow their passion is where I want to go. But I'm just curious because, and this is just a person, like a personal question to you, because I'm, I'm curious. I am aware of some of this stuff, but not obviously not all of it. And I try to do a good job to not let my emotional responses take over, but it's, pretty effing hard sometimes like it's just because you don't even think about it it's not you, you're not conscious again you're not conscious you're not consciously thinking about it you're just ba boom and sometimes it happens before you even realize how do we even start correcting a lot of this i know you talked about remembering who you are but even me i feel like i do a good job remembering who, who i am um but still those automated responses are just so programmed in there that it just feels almost impossible sometimes to snap out of it. So do you have any recommendations or things to start with to help facilitate that? So I think in terms, like practically speaking, I think people who have some practice, some type of mindfulness practice, it could be yoga, it could be meditation, it could be sitting in silence, whatever it is. People who have that start to develop a, a muscle, for lack of a better word, that they can use in the moment to pause before they react. You have to create some space between whatever your child is saying or doing and the way you respond. Mm. So, you know, from a practical standpoint, you have to practice that. And I know you know you know this already, but... Um, Sometimes I give the example of uh, a person who's training for a marathon. Mm -hmm. If you want to run a marathon and you buy the best kick-ass sneakers you can buy, is that enough for you to finish that marathon? No, it is not. It's a great start, but you have to now start developing a daily practice and a daily training. You have to have a plan. You have to you know, map out. How much time, what what are the distances you're going to run until you reach a point where you know, okay, I can complete this marathon, right? Yeah. Same thing in parenting. You can't just read a book or listen to an amazing parenting podcast, get an idea and say, oh, that was amazing. That was mind blowing. And then do nothing with it. Right. You have to start practicing and you have to be willing to mess up. You're going to practice. It's not going to work out. You're going to say to yourself, okay, next time I'm going to try and do it better. You're going to practice again. Ultimately, over time, if you are committed, you get there. But at the same, as you are practicing, part of the work of remembering who you are involves healing some of those wounds mm. that you've been carrying around. Because those wounds are the source of why people respond the way they do. We all have them, every human. Gotcha. Okay, so two questions onto that. Um, the mindfulness, do you think that it helps because it helps people be present and when we're present, we're very aware of what's going on, like the yoga and, the, and all that stuff? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I think what it, yes, it helps you to be present and why that is important is because being present snaps you out of autopilot thinking oh so yeah what happens is we have these like these scripts like these movie scripts going on in our minds and our child will say one thing and in the blink of an eye we already have a script going on that this is going to end up in, they're going to end up in prison or they're going to end up homeless or some other catastrophic event that we think is going to happen as a result of this one time that our child said defied us or said no or was rude to us right okay yeah that makes a lot of sense and that's what we talk about with messaging which is why i, lo I love talking to you about all this stuff because it's the same concepts but applied in two different areas and that's what we talk about is like when people consume your content your messaging it's going to go through their automated script so if you can learn to communicate so their automated script goes yep love it love it love it then you're going to be 10 times more effective as a marketer, business owner, whatever. And you're just saying as a parent, we actually want to turn those scripts off because it could be leading us down a path um, that we don't like 
you know, like maybe it's a bad relationship or not being as connected to our kids as we want. But being present is what really turns those automated scripts off to allow us to kind of understand how to navigate the situation. Exactly. Cool. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, okay. So let's talk a little bit about as parents, because one of my biggest things, and as you know, my deeper purpose is, is really about the next generation. It's about snapping people out of the old ways of operating because they're gone. Like the days of just sending your kid to college and they're going to go to a successful job. It's just gone and it's going to get worse. You know, um, I know I'm preaching to the choir with you, but for all the listeners out there, uh, there's more software that's going to come out. There's artificial intelligence that's coming out. There's machines that are replacing more jobs. Uh, cars are going to be able to drive themselves. You already see that with Tesla, which means delivery of jobs are going to be out. And that's just going to get more and more and more intense. And my belief is that we're we're going to see in the near future, this is why it's called the new generation entrepreneur, is we're going to see people having to make their own money, which is a beautiful thing because people can literally go make money with anything that they're passionate about. But the question that always plagues me, which is what I want to throw on you, Rachel, is I understand I can be the example to my kids. I know I can talk to them about all of this stuff, but how do we develop children that can one, adapt to know and understand understand that they have to undo conditioning, to under, like to go after what they want. Like, I, I don't know. I know my question's getting a little complicated now, but it's like, I understand this whole idea of being conditioned and the world telling me what to think and what to believe, but I'm like, I don't even know how to explain that to a seven-year-old. Like, I don't think they're going to get it. So I know it's a loaded question, but what are the first steps that we can take as parents to start having our kids be adaptable, go after what they want, follow the passions and not be indoctrinated into the way society has been operating for the last 50 years? I'll answer your question, but first I'll throw it back to you. What makes you think you need to do that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not remembering who so, I am, I guess, or some kind of conditioning has told me that parents need to teach their kids that. That's exactly right. Wow. That's exactly right. So if you remember who you are and you know, you don't know what's ha- what's going to happen tomorrow either, Brandon, right? right? Yeah. We don't know. The, the future, the, pre- the, the next moment is entirely unpredictable. But what do you say to yourself knowing, I mean, entrepreneurship, I mean, is that not the definition of unpredictable? It right. is, right? right? Nothing is known. Everything changes. How do you handle that? Are you asking me? Yeah, I, I, I know how you handle that because I do the same. You trust yourself. Right. You trust yourself. And can we trust our children that just like we navigated this path, they're going to have to navigate it too for themselves. It's not our job to shortcut these lessons for them. Why would we want to do that anyway? Right. Why would we want to rob them of the lessons that are pure gold, the lessons that are the key to their growth and development as human beings? I think that would be a huge disservice to them. So our job is not to give them the answer of how to adapt or uh, how to set themselves up to be successful or happy. Just like a good coach and a good mentor doesn't give answers, but rather asks better questions, that's what we have to do with them too. Can we ask them better questions that they're not asking themselves in order for them to develop the answer for themselves. Cause Will's answer is going to be different from your answer. Right. So would helping them learn the lessons that they need to learn be a good way to facilitate some of that? Like for example, you I, said that, that trust themselves, trusting yourself is a big part of entrepreneurship. So letting our kids go make mistakes, uh, or experience a success is a great way to get them to go trust themselves, like facilitating more of that type of stuff. Absolutely. And I think this is so, so hard as a parent to witness your child going through difficulty, to witness your child going through pain, to witness your child and not and suppress the urge to fix it. Mm. We just want to fix it because we want to take away the pain. That's a very natural 
uh, feeling for any parent with children at any age. This is true even if you have adult children. Right. But the real wisdom of a parent is one who can stay grounded and centered during the time that their child is experiencing something difficult. This is the growth. So they don't need you to fix it for them. They need you to trust them, to show them, oh, if my parent trusts me, maybe I can overcome this. Maybe my parent asks me questions that make me think of possible solutions mm. to whatever it is I'm dealing with. And this is true of any age. You can do this even with very young children. But certainly when you get into the school age and the teenage years, this is really our, I think, our highest role as parents, not to spoon feed them the answers so that we can set them up to fulfill our idea of a checklist, right. but rather let them trust them that they know how to do it. They already have the key. Yeah. That's one. And you know, I work with um, Don Javier Shaman was one of the things he talks to us about all the time. He's like, you don't own your kids. They're their own people with their own plan with their own personality, with their own desires, their own passions. He's like, the worst thing you can do as a parent is indoctrinate them into what who you are. Indoctrinate them into what you believe, um, what you want them to be, who you are. And even right now, like I I would love my kids to be entrepreneurs, but you know, I was talking to 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 Don Javier, I'm like, I, I don't really care if they are entrepreneurs or not. I have to let them be and like facilitate or raise them to be and remember who they are and be who they want to be and and all of that stuff and i think that just leads to a lot of happiness and i think that's what and again correct me if i'm i'm wrong on this but i think that is how we change generation after generation after generation is raising kids who again remember who they are and supporting them and, and trusting them um, can I give a, a, a like a little personal story? Because as I was listening to you talk, I was just having so many like ahas of my own life, and I kind of I, I look at and hopefully my in laws are not <laughs> watching this episode, but or listening to this episode. But my wife did grow up in a pretty controlling household compared to mine. And my my household um, was very trusting. So like you said, kids want to be trusted by their parents. Um. Yeah. Yeah. So my parents gave me a lot of trust. They basically said, if you're going to go to a party in high school, you're not going to be in trouble if you drink, but you'll be in trouble if you drink and drive. But like, we trust you go do. And I had a lot of freedom, but I was a good kid. Never drank in high school, never smoked, never did. I'd like focus on running. I was just, I mean, I was home by when I needed to be home, be home by. Um, but when I look at like Jacqueline's younger sister, for example, in a very controlling household, all the other older parents, or kids had left she was like a rebel, like rebelled a lot. And, and I look at the two different outcomes, but the two different parenting styles where it's like very controlling. And then it's like, I'm going to leave and me having a ton of freedom, but I was like, I don't really need to leave. Um, and I can see what you're talking about being played out just through those parenting styles. And it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, do you see that with a lot of people, like a lot of controlled households breeds a lot of rebellion in, in kids? Yeah, so I'll share from my own childhood, and hopefully my parents aren't listening either. <laughs> but uh, I was I was raised in a very controlling home and a home where I was not trusted at all. On the contrary, I was told so many times that I was naive and that I didn't um, that I didn't really understand how the world works, and it made me question like maybe I don't understand how the world works and Lord knows what danger is out there that I wouldn't even be aware of because I'm so quote unquote naive. Right. And and I was super, super controlled in terms of what I could do, what I was allowed to do, what I wasn't allowed to do. My parents were super protective of me. And as a result, I think this is one of the, the key things that shaped me when I became an adult to try and be super controlling. And I, I wasn't, I'm not so controlling of other people, but I was super controlling of myself. And I'm, uh, I call myself a recovering perfectionist because I try to really control everything to be perfect. 
And, and as you know, I mean, that's a killer of creativity. It's a killer of authenticity. It's, it, it, it made me super miserable. Right. But I had to play that out somehow. I had to play out that controlling and I could see it even when I became a parent. I saw how I was still, despite all the work I had done on myself, I was still trying to control how my children were behaving. I was trying to control how other people perceived my children mm. because that was a reflection back on me. So I was still, you know, repeating this dynamic, even right. though I thought I had dealt with it. But what I learned is really you never finish dealing with your stuff. You just keep doing iterations on it. And every time you do an iteration around the same issue, you, you, you know, you elevate your consciousness and you reach deeper levels of understanding and knowing. Yeah. But it's a journey. It's a lifelong journey. Yeah, it makes sense. And it's a beautiful journey, too, to kind of go through that and grow. That's what, to me, that's what life is all about. Um, I know you have a master class coming up pretty soon for those listeners who can want to learn more about this, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I may regret this, but I'm going to throw something back on you and I'm just going to see what happens and where you take it. I agree with everything that you're saying and I love all of this stuff. And I do believe that this is literally how we change the world. I, I think that if we want to change the world for the better, it's a generational thing that starts with us, with the next generation to give them and then them with their kids all the way down. But I also see the value in bad times, mistakes, hard times. And one could argue having parents that were very controlling formed who you are today and led you to this path now, which is helping more people. Couldn't we argue that having controlling parents was in fact a good thing? And if we are those types of parents to our kids, that it could be leading to something good and teaching them lessons as well? So yes and no. Okay. I am in 100% agreement with you that our challenging times and what we what we call our difficult times are our biggest opportunities for growth. Uh -huh. We don't always take those opportunities, but they're there for us. In fact, life will continue to serve up those opportunities for you to grow where you need to grow. Mm. This is true of every human, no matter how you parent. So even if you are, I don't know, imagine the most conscious parent that you can imagine, your child is still going, don't worry, they're still going to have <laughs> plenty opportunity. You're not bypassing anything for them. You're not shortcutting anything for them. What you're doing is you're setting them up with the tools to navigate those challenges in the best way they can navigate them. Mm. So had I not been raised by controlling parents, had I been raised by different parents, I would have internalized other issues, not this one. I would have internalized something else. My children are also internalizing their own things because as, you know, as well-meaning, as conscious, as aware as I am, I still don't control their wiring, their genetic makeup, their experiences that are not in in my house. Yeah. So they're still absorbing the entire world, which is set up kind of like a matrix, you know? Yeah. So part of my job, I think, is just to make them aware of the fact that there are systems and institutions and matrices all over the place and to learn how to navigate that. But I recognize fully that my children are going to have their own growth journey, their own path, their own difficulties and challenges. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how they navigate those things. Yeah. So if I, if I hear you correctly, what you're saying is um, no matter what happens, they're going to face difficult times in the future. Um, we have a choice to make those difficult times harder as parents or and and be the number one difficult thing in their life or let something else be that difficult thing in their life um number one number two is that we have the opportunity to help them navigate those difficult times because there's no avoiding it and uh one of the things that i've learned I th through the, my own personal development journey 
is that when we go through hard times, we're, we can go through hard times in a chaos, emotional state where we're completely at the victim of our emotions, or we can still go through the exact same hard time, more controlled, happier, confident, and and not be suffering from those emotional, uh, well, I guess from the emotions, and that's kind of what you're talking about as well, is that we can not be their number one growth opportunity thing, bad thing in their life, but number two, show them how to navigate those more powerfully and strongly. Is that correct? Exactly. Because if there is one thing I can guarantee you, I can't guarantee much, but this one thing I can guarantee, mm -hmm. there is pain in life. There is pain and there is challenge. That is you will have to go through no matter who you are, no matter your circumstances, no matter who raised you or where you were raised. Right. But suffering, that is not mandatory. That is optional. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's beautiful. That's well, way better put than, than, uh, than I would, <laughs> what I was trying to say. So I love that. Um, so this, I, I mean, I love all of this stuff. And I think, again, this is how we raise kids to be happier, to follow their passions, uh, to go after what they what they want, like truly. And I think it's going to be a necessary thing we have to do with the way the world is going. So um, for any parents out there that would want to learn more from Rachel, want to learn how to be a conscious parent, um, how to develop a better relationship with your kids, you do have a masterclass going on today, right? The 18th, May yep. 18th. So yep. tell us a little bit about it and tell us where they can go to register for that. So the masterclass is at sagacitylab.com forward slash MC waitlist, and we'll link it in the show notes. Can you can you spell that? This is, uh, uh, sagacity part. S a g a c i t y l a b dot com forward slash m c waitlist, and um, we're gonna that master class is really going to dig deep into this topic of punishing our kids and what we could do differently. We're going to talk about why it doesn't work, why it backfires, and what are the alternatives and how can we shift our perspective on something that is viewed as a staple of parenting. Yeah, I love that. And uh, for anyone, again, if anything that we talked about or Rachel talked about today is interesting to you, you want to learn more about that, you want a better relationship with your kids, you don't want to discipline your kids, but you still want them to... Uh, I could not do what they're told, but how follow those boundaries. Like you said, I highly recommend every single one of you go and register for that today. Uh, Rachel, as we finish out the episode, um, I we'll have five, four questions for you. Rapid right. fire questions. And I'm actually, when most people come onto the podcast, we actually talk about their business journey. We actually didn't even get to talk about your business journey at all. We talked more just basically about uh, parenting, which is something I love talking about. So <clears throat> it'll be interesting to hear your answers to these. But with that said, um, the number one question is, what's the number one pivotal moment in your business that shifted everything? But I think for you, you could either take it the direction of business or what's the number one pivotal moment in parenting that shifted everything for you? I'm going to answer that in um, in parenting because that was that's the first thing that came to my mind. It was when, so I have nine-year-old twins and when they were two years old, one of them was, one of them had a very hard time regulating himself emotionally. And I mean, two-year-olds are not exactly known for their self-regulation skills, but mm -hmm. this kid was an outlier even amongst two-year-olds. And I had taken him to every expert I could think of to quote unquote fix him. Mm -hmm. And the moment I could see myself trying to fix him instead of understanding that I was the problem, mm -hmm. he, he didn't have a problem. I can tell you this now looking back, he didn't have a problem. Yeah. I had a problem. I had a problem accepting him for who he is because I ultimately had a problem accepting myself for who I am. Wow. Back to remembering who you are. Yeah. Jeez. And that powerful. changed everything for me. 
Wow. We could have just had that as the podcast episode and just called it a day. <laughs> super, real. super powerful. Uh, okay. Question number two. Do you believe that entrepreneurship should be taught in schools? I do not. Why not? I do not because uh, I believe critical thinking skills should be taught in school. Mm. I think entrepreneurship in and of itself is like asking, do you think medicine should be taught in school? No, because not everybody wants to be a doctor. Right. And not everybody right. wants to be an entrepreneur or should be an entrepreneur. But the skills behind being an entrepreneur, like critical thinking, innovation, those I would love to see taught in school, just as we teach some of the fundamentals of medicine. If you look at you know science or biology, those are kind of gateways into medicine. So I think there could be gateways into entrepreneurship that I would love see to see in schools. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I agree with that for the most part. It would be nice to see entrepreneurship at least taught as a career option to people, which is I just blows my mind that it's not. Um, but I agree with you. I think critical thinking and all of that stuff and even just mindset type stuff should definitely be taught in, taught in schools for sure. Um, okay. So two more questions. Third one is when making decisions, do you lead with your head or your heart? That's a tough one for me. I lead with my heart, but my head is so super active and opinionated that it's sometimes <laughs> hard to shut it off. <laughs> I hear ya. I think everyone has that problem. Um, cool. And the last question is where, I know we didn't get to talk a lot about business, but where do you see yourself in, in five years? Mm. Yeah, I could go a lot of directions with that one. Ultimately, what I would love is to know that I've had impact on parents and how they raise their children. Because what I would like to see in the world is people who grow up knowing who they are and having the tools to navigate life better than we've been doing and that previous generations have been doing. And to me, the gateway to that is parenting because even though not all of us are going to grow up to become parents, mm -hmm. but all of us were children. And what would our world look like if these children who are raised by what I call parenting architects, what are they going to do in the world? What are those children, what kind of impact are they going to have to change the world if they are raised up with so much less conditioning? Right. Love that. I couldn't agree more. And uh, for anyone who wants to learn more about you, I know you have your your masterclass today. And by the way, if if you're listening to this uh, episode past May 18th, you can still go to that same link and it'll just put you on a wait list for the next masterclass or anything like that. But where else can people go? Do you have Instagram, website, all that good stuff? I do, I do. So on Instagram, I am underscore Rachel Duffy Coach underscore. And I'm also on Facebook. You can look me up on Sagacity Lab. Um, and I'm also on LinkedIn. If you uh, search my name on LinkedIn, I'm super active there too. Awesome. Rachel, uh, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, it's always great having these types of conversations with you. So I, I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you. Of course. And for those of you who are uh, or have not left us a review on iTunes yet, if you liked this episode or any of the podcasts that we have done, or if you just like our podcast, go leave us a review on iTunes. I would be so grateful for that. And we do have our Facebook group called the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast Facebook group where we are going to start building a community, giving inside uh tips about the episodes and be releasing some secret episodes only inside that group. So make sure you head over there and we'll see you guys on the next episode of the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast. Hey guys, thank you so much for checking out another episode of the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, go below, hit the subscribe button and make sure you click on that bell icon and get notified every time we drop a new episode. Now, if you're looking for the show notes, we have them linked underneath this video as well as our social media handles and some links to free training and offers that we drop from time to time to help you guys even further. So go check those out if you're interested and thank you so much for tuning in to the New Generation Entrepreneur Podcast.